Hello, and thank you for tuning in. On behalf of all of us at Books and Books, I welcome you to a virtual event with Mariana Velasquez and Erin Goyot to discuss Colombiana, a rediscovery of recipes and rituals from the soul of Colombia. Mariana Velasquez is an international food stylist, artist, and chef. Her work has been featured in the New York Times, Vogue, Food and Wine, Bon Appetit, Gourmet, and Gourmet Magazine, to name a few. A published author of three recipe books, she has also styled, art directed, developed recipes, and collaborated on more than 20 cookbooks throughout her career. She collaborated on two books that received James Beard Book Awards. First Lady Michelle Obama hired Mariana to sell for the First Lady's American Grown Project. Born in Bogota, Mariana lives in Brooklyn, New York with her husband. Erin Goyaga is a Seattle-based Basque country-born and raised cookbook author, food stylist, and photographer. Erin's work focuses on the emotional component of food and everyday life through visual stories. Erin Goyaga's second cookbook, Cana de Vanilla, Nourishing Gluten-Free Recipes for Every Meal and Mood, was published in 2019 and has been recognized by the New York Times, Food 52, Food and Wine, Bon Appetit, Washington Post, NBC News, and more. Erin's first cookbook was published in 2012, Small Plates and Sweet Treats, My Family's Journey to Gluten-Free Cooking. Goyaga has styled and photographed multiple other cookbooks as well. Throughout tonight's broadcast, you're invited to ask questions by using the Ask a Question feature at the bottom of the screen. And of course, you can order copies of Colombiana by pressing the green button below. That also leads to our wider shop site where you can order all of Mariana's books and all of Erin's books as well. Uh, we appreciate each and every order, and we also appreciate the generous donations from viewers everywhere. And now, without further ado, I'd like to invite our guests to the virtual stage. Hi. 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 There we go. Hello. Hi, Ron. Hola. Como estas? <laughs> Good to see you. <laughs> so good to see you. Congratulations on your beautiful book. Thank you so right much. Here. I actually was, um, I mean, I've, I've had it for a couple of weeks and I've been uh, browsing through it. Um, but then last night when I was getting ready for, for this interview, I was just like so immersed in it and just so in awe of all of the things that I don't know. And it just made me want to go to Colombia and uh, it just it's just such a beautiful kind of like almost like a film, this book. Um, so I'm like so um, excited to talk to you and uh, congratulations. Thank you. I'm, I'm so flattered to hear this, especially coming from you with such an amazing career in the beauty of food. You know, I've been following you for so long since your blog started and it's just, you know, it's a dream to be sharing this time together. Oh, I'm so excited. Well, first, tell us a little bit about, you have a very interesting um, way that you came into uh, writing this cookbook, but in food styling and actually working as a chef before in professional kitchens. So um, how did you arrive in the US? How did you kind of make that transition from Colombia where you grew up? So, you know, I grew up in Bogota and very early on when I was pretty young in high school, I realized that I wanted to have a career in food, but I wasn't really sure how to make that happen. You know, we're talking 1999 when being a chef wasn't glamorous or on TV or it was kind of like a, a very much a behind the scenes profession. And I came to New York initially to do a gap year before returning to college. And I decided to start staging in restaurants and really research and find the ways that you could actually become a chef. And life, you know, with all the turns that it takes, um, took me to California, to Big Sur, where I staged in this beautiful restaurant called Sierra Mar in Big Sur. And I was supposed to be there for three days. And, and, and I ended up staying for a year and a half, you know. Oh, my God. <laughs> and I found my calling you know i mean i always love food i grew up in a family where the table is the axle of the way you know how we work but that restaurant really told me everything i know now you know that philosophy of the pure ingredients it was a new menu every day we had 
you know, it was farm to table before the term even was being used. It was, it was really mm -hmm. spectacular. And realizing that, you know, beautiful food and well-produced ingredients and respected creations and recipes were my passion, but really, really what drove me was the ritual of the table. So, so the culture behind, behind our ceremony of sitting down to share food together. And then food styling was kind of the consequence of that because it combined everything I love about food. So cooking, but also art and photography and understanding the history and the context behind those dishes to be able to create a scene and portray it in film or video. Mm -hmm. So that's a very edited version of these 22 years, but yeah, yeah, yeah. So were you at ever, when you started cooking, you know, in California, were you ever asked, were you doing family meals that were Colombian or things you grew up with, or were you trying to just really learn, you know, because, you know, your mother cooking culture is so yeah. ingrained in you, but were you trying to like, I don't want to say suppressed, but were you just like, oh, now I'm in California, I'm going to embrace sort of the California cooking, especially of that 90s era um, that you were mentioning? Or were you were you always kind of bringing this, your kind of roots always forward? Yeah, no, not at all. I wasn't even thinking about Colombian food back then. I wanted to learn everything else. I wanted to learn techniques. I wanted to learn about other traditions. I wanted to taste and understand the food from a very different perspective. Mm -hmm. And there was a yearning, of course, like that thing that we have when we, as immigrants, are away from home. But, but I was just so curious about everything else. And mm -hmm. you know, it took me this long to kind of like do the full circle and come back to it. Also to feel kind of ready to be able to honor the food of my country in the mm -hmm. way that it that I felt that was necessary. You know, I, it was too personal and also too delicate to take it lightly. So that's why it took me all these years. But for a very long time, I didn't cook Colombian food when I was here. I, I very un much understand that. And other authors I've spoken to um, who have other culture heritages, but I have grown up sort of in a melting pot area Mm -hmm. say the same thing and i myself uh as an immigrant from spain living in the u.s for about the same time as you i do feel like the same like it just takes it's like a it's almost like it takes maturity to really go back to what you what was comfortable for you and maybe things and maybe i'm projecting maybe this is me more but give uh, taking things for granted right the things that you are so natural to your environment and that you grew up with um but you also have Sorry, I'm kind of jumping around, but no, no. speaking of sort of the melting pots, and I was reading a little bit in your book that you have Middle Eastern, uh, you know, family heritage. So how was that like? And, and then also understanding, since I've never been to Colombia, like understanding all of the kind of indigenous cultures and all the indigenous food and native food, plus all the inf influences from, you know, the rest of the world, whether it's Europeans, Middle Eastern, Asians, like just the melting pot that it is. So tell us a little bit like what your sort of particular uh, household was like and then how that melange or like that melting pot of different cultures um, end up colliding in Colombian food. I know it's a very broad question. But. No, no, no. So, you know, my, so my dad's side of the family is Lebanese. My great grandparents came from Beirut and landed in all places, this town, this dusty town, like 30 miles inland from the Caribbean coast called Cincelejo. And there was a big, or there still is a big Lebanese community there. So that's why they arrived. My great grandfather was a textile merchant and they settled in this town and they had to start a new life, you know, but the cooking stayed as present as ever, right? Because that was kind of like what kept them close to home. And so it's fascinating because today you walk into a tiny town, you know, in the middle of nowhere, especially in that area of the Sinu River Valley, and you'll walk into a little store and you'll have arepas, you'll have empanadas, you'll have kibe, you'll have 
tahini. I mean, you have things that are completely now part of the local cuisine as well. Mm -hmm. And so I grew up very much like that, with that Mediterranean influence in food, Middle Eastern, um, that grandiosity of the table, you know, both my grandmothers, my maternal grandmother was half German and also from the region of Antioquia. And her food and her table was just, you know, the kitchen was always happening and she had, she would host every Sunday, a big family lunch. And it was, everything was around the table in both mm -hmm. cases of our families. Mm -hmm. And, you know, on my dad's side, the food was always Lebanese, but then on my mother's side, all the indigenous foods and recipes were super present, as well as all the Spanish influence, you know? So we had the lentejas con chorizo, and then the next day, maybe the red bean soup, como la frijolada with plantains and chicharrón and avocado, and all of the presence of corn, of course, in the different preparations from cornbreads to envueltos, which are like a little tamal, tamales, which are also made with corn and chickpeas. And in some cases, you'll see tamales that have um, raisins and capers and olives. So mm -hmm. it's a complete combination of all of these cultures. And, and I love how, while throughout history, Colombian cuisine has adopted many flavors from different places, there's still a very much, a very basic, set of uh, preparations that remain traditional, you know, like mm -hmm. the Adam, for instance. But because there are, you know, 26 indigenous ethnic groups in Colombia alone, it's, we still preserve all of those fermented drinks, the fruit vinegars, and things that thankfully continue to be present. Mm -hmm. It's so fascinating because a lot of the ingredients that you mentioned, I mean, the first like few chapters i'm just like wow there's so much information um you know really like when i was looking through uh, the beginnings of like all the different ingredients in the areas um it was just like really like things that i've never mame lulo things that i i mean when i look the translation maybe i can figure them out but i very unfamiliar with a lot of these things and it's just so much of it yeah yeah and so tell us a little bit more about and then i see santander which is like a spanish city yeah that i grew up very close to but it is so different right like so yeah. all these influences when i see them here um it's just uh incredible to me tell us a little bit about like this page like all the stuff all the different like sort of the, the things that would you would say are really um staples or you know, corn for sure and coffee. And so, but what are the things that you would miss here, for example, that you can't really um, get, here. Yeah. get here or like the cooking wouldn't be the same without these things? I mean, I would say the main, main thing is the tropical fruits. You know, the lulo, as you're mentioning, the mame, the curuba. There, there's an incredible variety of tropical fruits in Colombia that it's, just it's overwhelming you know you go to those markets and visually it's a dream and that fruit doesn't really travel or not very much you know in new york for instance you'll find mame and it's actually in season right now so it's something that you can get um tell us a little bit about mame because i was just like so fascinated with all these things so mame is this fruit it's brown on the outside and it has the best coral flesh that is very creamy, it's almost like pudding. So imagine it when raw has the, te the texture of a baked sweet potato. And it has kind of like the same, the tones are very similar to a very, very ripe persimmon, for instance. Okay. But it's hands down my favorite, favorite fruit. And I make a pie with it that is traditionally made in Cartagena. And it's one of those things that is just delicious. And what I did in, in order to replace some of these things that are hard to find, I found flavors that are similar so that the recipes could be made. Or there's a great solution for tropical fruit is that now you can find a lot of the frozen pulps in a lot of Latin American markets. So, you know, the key is to look in the back that they don't have a lot of water so that the flavor isn't diluted in the pulp. 
but my intention was to develop recipes that would be able to be prepared here in the U.S and ingredients that would be easily found, you know. Do you have an online resource? Um, I do, so you... in the book I list some resources, but you know, more and more the Latin American sections in grocery stores in the main mm -hmm. in the US get more variety and options of ingredients. And more often than not, there's a Colombian community in those cities, so it's- Yeah, true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. especially my- I also like the cooking, my, um, utensils well the parrilla right yeah. for the arepas yeah, okay yeah. but tell us about arepas because i'm i don't eat i can't eat wheat so yeah. any country that relies on a sort of alternative when i say alternative i mean anything but wheat um to yeah. cook it's really exciting to me and i've had arepas but you say the arepas that you find most of the time in the u.s are not really how they're treated in actual colombia right Right. I mean, because in Colombia, arepas are very minimalist. You know, they're made with corn, they're ground. So you cook the corn, you ground it, and then you shape the arepas into very thin patties and then grill them um, either on a flat top or on an actual grill. But then arepas can also be the choclo, which means that they're sweet. They're made with sweet corn and cheese. And it's like a completely, I mean, it's still an arepa, but it's a very different experience. Because so where, like, it, how do you eat them? Like when that, when you eat the sweet one? So when I eat the sweet one, I just do a little bit of butter and salt. And in the book to make it a full meal, I made a tomato and avocado kind of salad to put it on top. But usually and I wake up and I have an arepa on the griddle with a little bit of fresh cheese and salt. And it's just kind of like that really soothing, comforting food. Mm -hmm. And you know, arepas in different regions of Colombia are made with green chickpeas, with yuca, with different types of corn, with ñame, which is this white yam. So there's many, many options, but the traditional is the white corn. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, because I was looking through this and I saw all the different colors and, and textures and I was really intrigued. So when you make them at home, do you actually cook the corn yourself and, yeah. and just, from start to finish? Yeah, there are, so in the book, there are a couple versions of the recipe. Um, when I do the cracked corn, it's great because it becomes kind of like an afternoon ritual where my husband and I get on making arepas, we invite friends and we make tons of them so that everybody can take to freeze. And then when I want to make kind of like the quicker version, I use masa and okay. just add water and a little oil or butter. And um, and then yuca arepas are delicious too, which I don't have a recipe for them in the book, but hopefully soon. <laughs> yuca okay, is cassava too, right? Yes. The cassava root, yeah. Yeah, and you know, Colombian food is very gluten-free, I have to say. You know, we use a lot of yuca starch, yuca flour, which is cassava, a lot of rice mm -hmm. flour as well, and all the corn, so yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, I was looking through it and everything seemed to be like really easy for me to eat and make. So I was super excited yeah. about that. Um, so if you are to host mm -hmm. now, you know, for your, a bunch of friends here, which I'm, I'm sure you do, um, what are some of the recipes that you would make from the book? From the book? Tell us and I'll show them. Okay. So, you know, I really love the lile and lentils because it's a menu that really brings together all the things I love, you know, like red carnations, that Spanish influence that, you know, is undeniable in our country. And so I make a big pot of lentils with chorizo, I make a white rice, and I top it with crispy sweet plantains, which is something my grandmother used to do. She would deep mm. fry or roast tiny cubes of plantains and then top the rice with it. And it's like that perfect combination of sweet and savory. And I'll make some cocktails with lile, which is this fortified wine mm -hmm. with sour orange juice, and then coconut flan for dessert, which is one of my favorite recipes in the book. It's my grandmother's recipe, literally from her, like, I'll show you, you know. I'm looking for them, I'm not quick enough. Oh, wow, that's incredible. Yeah, I, a lot of the recipes from the book came from, from this book which was hers and her name was Adela and she was an incredible 
baker and yeah that's amazing wait i'm looking for here's this yeah oh no you have the delay here i'm just like as i'm looking through all the pages <laughs> i can't believe the photography i can't um no so years, i mean they really really understood the light and the flavor of colombia even even though we were here they were just so tuned in yes that's the coconut dessert yeah that looks amazing i um you know kind of looks like the flan yes yeah. and so anytime i see this it's just like okay what are the differences right in the recipes and so this is quite different even though yeah it is like a flan but like the little bit of the egg separated and it's just i always love seeing how recipes that are so basic have evolved as they've traveled through the world right so i'm making i'm going to be making this one oh, I, I love it <laughs> so okay are you hosting a ton now like do you host so, or and we host all the time and since people started getting back together we started hosting again and i have to say the first dinner that we had about a month and a half ago i was so nervous it's almost like before I used to do it without thinking, you know, I would prepare very well and make my list and make my menu and drink the table and set it up. I had anticipation that I couldn't sleep for a couple of days because it was like, oh, it's again, it's like it's happening again. But we host a lot and, and lately because of this work with the book, then more and more I make Colombian food and, and people love it, you know, in New York, especially, where you have all these options, right? You can eat the cuisine of everywhere in the world and have a great experience in the city. And then for Colombian food, isn't really the case. There are some good Colombian restaurants in Queens, but but that home cooked experience is it just unique and, you know, like yeah. where else, you know, nothing. Yeah, like and also just like really understanding it. I feel like it's not just about these recipes that are just written out. I feel like there's so much context. That's what I, I love about books too is just really understanding where uh where the author comes from and not just the origin but just like with the point of view and um i i wanted to be i don't know if i said it to you earlier but when when a book is like a film and it's just really embalmed i always say it's like embalming in a feeling of a place and and yeah. it's so much like that i can't and then the images that are scattered throughout that are of the places and the people tell us a little bit because i'm just like i can't get enough of the photography so tell us and because you're a food stylist tell us a little bit about the process of creating like the visual narrative of it i mean it's just like so i just feel like when i see this i feel like i've never been to cartagena but i feel like i'm probably in some uh terrace or something in cartagena. Yeah. <laughs> So, you know, I had, after styling so many people's cookbooks and finally getting to do my own, you know, do my own styling, my own recipes, I had planned this incredible trip to Colombia with Gentle and Hires, and we were going to go from Bogota all the way for maybe 10 or 12 days through the entire country by car. You know, we would travel through the mountains, up to Medellin, down the Sunu River Valley to the coast. And then that was planned for April last year. And so that plan changed. And I tried to readjust the dates and that wasn't, you know, just we didn't know what was going to happen. So we decided to shoot the book here in Brooklyn and bring Colombia to Brooklyn, bring all the props. I had been collecting oh textiles, ceramics, different elements from Colombian culture and tables and makers and I just had it all shipped and we recreated or basically not recreated. It was, we talked a lot with gentle and hires about what Colombia feels like mm -hmm. and the magic of the light there and the equator where the shadows are long and it's very romantic. And basically before every, every shot, we talked about the context and how it felt to be eating it there. Mm -hmm. and they're so talented they they created those moments you know and mm -hmm. so we shot in brooklyn at this great place in bushwick we went upstate and sometimes from that you know from that grieving of not being able to shoot it in colombia creatively it was like 
my mind opened up in a way that I never expected. And also, and it also I'm yeah. sorry to interrupt you, but it also is, I mean, now that you tell me, I, I wouldn't have known necessarily, but it almost adds a little bit to the meaning of Colombiana, right? Like you're, you're not, you're, you're coming from a place of memory too. And sort of like, I think nostalgia, yeah. I know some people don't like it, but I find it super romantic and really beautiful and evocative. And so I love that story actually that you, you know, it's almost like it made it even more personal to you. Oh, completely. And to your circumstance. I'm just like <laughs> obsessed. Like this one. Lomito de cerdo, altaramindo y menta. Ah, it's so beautiful. <laughs> so there's then, a chapter that's called Colombianish, where mm -hmm. I take Colombian flavors and it's more my take. And that's where you'll see a little bit of like the, the New York cuisine style in some moments, but it's all the Colombian flavors and how I interpret them. Mm -hmm. I love that. And it's funny, I don't, so many, you know, as a, I'm a native Spanish speaker, but so many things I don't, I don't know what they mean. Okay. And, and I love that. Yeah. And also you're, you pay homage to so many uh, people here, mostly women. Yeah. Um, tell us a little bit about that. So, because we were here in New York and I thought, okay, so if we're not going to be on the road finding incredible chefs and cooks and makers along the way, why don't we tell the stories of Colombian women who live here, who are the backbone of our cuisine overseas, who work in food and in all their capacities in very different sort of ways of the world of food, they represent Colombia. They're the Colombianas. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, it was five of them, a chef, an entrepreneur, uh, a lady who makes ahi and delivers it to your house. So all of them, you know, La Nena, Vivi, Ella. <laughs> I want to go to Colombia so bad. Please. So, <laughs> tell us what to expect. I mean, I guess the, each trip when somebody travels is very... Um, it's, it's very personal, right? And it's yeah. somebody's experience is their own. But like, what do you think as someone who's never been to Colombia, like what they, what kind of like um, open mind, I mean, everybody should travel with an open mind, but uh, what should they kind of carry with them as they go in? Like what, what is, what can they expect? Or what is the, the feeling you think they're gonna anticipate? And not anticipate, but they're gonna be like greeted with. Yeah, I mean, I think generosity, you know, people are very generous and very welcoming. There's a lot of warmth, you know, you walk into someone's home, no matter how humble or or the conditions that you're always offered a cup of tinto, which is black coffee or with a little bit of milk. And so there's that, there's that kind of warmth and, and openness. And then I would say that the true way to experience Colombia is to travel by car to see mm -hmm. the rural areas, to see the small towns, because that's where you really get the texture of, of our cuisine and also our culture. You know, it's mm -hmm. not, in the cities, it's pretty international. People dress like anywhere else, right? But then in those small towns, you still see, uh, for instance, in different towns in the coffee region, you still see the men riding horses with this great satchel and a poncho, which is kind of, you know, like a little, like a little piece of cloth that they use for everything, this beautiful cotton. So things like that, you know, that you would miss if you're in a big city. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, I mean, I feel like most places are best if you, you know, kind of get lost a little bit or, or drive around and yeah. go see the small places. Um, yeah, and um, for this summer, I'm kind of going, I'm looking at my questions. I'm a little bit all over the place because I had something prepared, but I'm just so in inspired by um, talking to you. And like, so this summer, like, what do you think people, just tell us what you think people should cook from your, from your book. Okay, so I think that they should definitely make a patillazo, which is this great watermelon and lime punch. That is a street food amazing. from Barranquilla. It's, it's so simple and it's so refreshing and delicious. Last year on the shoot, which was 98 degrees, we were dying on a heat wave. At the end of the day, we were eating and drinking this watermelon punch that has the chunks of, um, of the fruit steeped in the lime juice. And it's 
so refreshing and easy. And then I would say the gazpacho de papaya, the mm. papaya gazpacho with charred leeks. Um, because, you know, gazpacho, I, anytime I have an opportunity for cold soup, <laughs> I have to yeah. adore that. <laughs> yes. It's so good. A lot of drinks, which I, um, I'm very excited about. Yeah. A lot I, of drinks and, you know, repurposing some things like I make these pineapple cocktail, but then I use the pineapple peels to make an infusion. So, you know, in Colombia, nothing goes to waste. People really, really think about like using the ingredients to the very, you know, completely. And so this looks incredible also as I'm reading the ingredients. Yeah, the lulada. Is lulada. Oh, yeah. Well, tell us a little bit about this. So lulada is from the Cauca Valley, especially from the city of Cali. And it's a drink that it has lulo, you know, which is this mm -hmm. fruit that we were talking about earlier. It's a very sour and floral fruit and it has corn and pineapple. So the corn yeah. kernels are cooked and it's kind of like hominy, you know, it's, it's a larger kernel. And so you sort of sip it and eat it with a spoon and it has spices, it's so delicious. And it's also wow. super refreshing and they serve it. They sell it in these big metal vats on the street and you just, you know, pick up a lulada. And I, you know, I say that I poison it a little bit with aguardiente, which is, <laughs> which is our anise uh, liqueur. So it doesn't normally have any alcohol? Sometimes it does, but on okay. the street it doesn't. Yeah. Wow. Or three pounds of green mango, you say. Oh my gosh, I am so, yes. <laughs> so excited. Um, I hope everybody will will actually go out and get the book because I truly, I'm not just saying this because we're talking now, but I, I am just in love with it. And I think it's just a masterpiece and just so beautiful. And um, it, for me personally, not knowing much about Colombia, just, you know, I can't wait to learn more. So we'll, we'll plan a yeah. trip. <laughs> I, would, I would love to. I'm going to join when you go back with uh, Andrea and Marty. <laughs> Me apunto. <laughs> <They wanna. laughs> All right, so we have a few questions from the audience. Um, I just want to remind everyone in the audience to, that you can ask a question by clicking the ask a question button. Um, there's a little two right next to it but below the screen. All right, let's see. Let's start with this one. This is from Karen. Uh, not a question, but thank you. I'm Colombian living in Brooklyn and was over the moon when I got your book mm -hmm. on June 15th. Would love to meet you, Maya. <laughs> Hi, Karen. Thank you so much. This means the world to me. And this book especially was written for people like you, either who have, you know, Colombian heritage or are far away from home and then from people like Aran who want to discover our cuisine. So thank you. Well, I hope you get some a few in-person events in you know in the in the coming months um, where you can meet your fans. Okay, so here we go. You've worked on many cookbooks in addition to creating your own. What do you think is important in a cookbook? Something readers might not expect. You know, I think cookbooks should be written um, kind of like as literature. I mean, I want to read cookbooks not necessarily only cook from them. So I think it's important for the books to be a joy to read and study and understand what the author wants to tell you. And, and also that they're reliable, right? Like the recipes have to work. <laughs> and so that's really important. And you know, Aran, as Aran knows, like recipe testing is kind of like a daunting, really, really serious task when it comes to, to putting a book together. Mm -hmm. Would you agree? Yeah, I think there's like the two sides and, and, and that's why it takes so many different kind of brains to do it, which is one, a very pragmatic kind of testing side that's almost a little mechanical, I find, mm -hmm. especially with like baking recipes. And it's it's very, it has to be very precise and, and almost like, um, I call it like the German brain, which yeah. you have. So <laughs> that that brain. And then the other side, which is, you know, you're trying to create a piece of art. It is art and it is, you're kind of leaving a little bit of your soul in the moment, you know, we all evolve as human beings, but like in that moment, this is where you were in your life. And uh, this book came from this 
you know, longing for your home or, or whatever. Each author has a different thing. So I think like they're two different things. And then that can be encapsulated through photography and styling and, um, and then the writing. So it's just like so many aspects. And I feel like this is so, uh, I'm going to say dense, but dense in a good way. Like there is so much of that. It's so weighted and heavy with all of it. So congrats. I mean, seriously, I know I'm just probably making you blush, but I mean it. And it's I love really... blushing. <laughs> <laughs> okay. What would be the two food recipes and the two drink recipes you would want your readers to make first? Mil gracias, Pase. <laughs> well, I have to say because I'm all about dessert. There's a recipe I when well, no, there's a dessert that I kind of like have a weak spot for called enyukal, which is a yuca cake, and it's on page two seventy two, uh, and it's so delicious, and it's like it looks this, so good, and it has a perfect kind of like crispy outside, and it's a little bit gummy on the inside. And it has cheese and yuca. It's delicious, and I drink it with coffee. You know, and it's gluten free. <laughs> and it's gluten free, exactly. So I'm I'm kind of fascinated. You you say a lot about cheese. It seems like cheese is actually like savory cheese is used very much in much. in yeah. sweet baking. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, savory cheese is used a lot, and you know, one of the surprising things is that it's also used in drinks. So, for instance, hot chocolate, como chocolate caliente. You, a lot of the times, it's served with little chunks of cheese that you add to the cup of chocolate. And so as you're drinking your chocolate, you're also fishing out these like melty, chewy, amazing, salty, that balances the sweetness of the chocolate in a brilliant way. And so- Wow, that's amazing. Yeah, yeah. So um, frozen grated yuca. Okay, I'm gonna look for, I'm gonna go to our, I need to explore the Seattle kind of- yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. American markets, um, so much stuff. And and uh, um, anise, how do you yeah. say it? Anise, anise, anise. anise. Oh, yeah. so good. Yeah, I love. I would have never expected that um, combination. I love that. <laughs> Are there more questions? We have a few more. Okay. Um. You talk so much about your family's influence on your food. Do you think that's uniquely Colombian or would you say most chefs are inspired by those dish dishes they had when they were young? And Erin, I'm sure you can weigh in on this as well. I, I mean, I can only speak for myself, but you know, food is so personal and so intimate and is deeply rooted. And so for me, absolutely, my family plays a huge role in the way I cook and in the way that I relate to food, so yeah. yeah. And I think that's what makes us all interesting is that we all have different backgrounds and especially coming from, I know you also and me coming from a family that cooked, my my grandparents and my on my mom's side, so my mom and all my uncles and aunts, um, they were all pastry chefs. So to me, that makes me, I feel like I'm so lucky that I have that mm -hmm. such a you know, almost like in my blood and, to, you know, I, I will always be, I mean, I'm forever evolving and inspired. I'm going to go to Colombia and I'm going to learn a ton, yeah. but, but my heritage is kind of like what's in my heart. And I think for everybody, and I know for you, yeah. it's the same. And I think that's, what's so beautiful that we are all different and that we all carry different uh, sensibilities into food. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. Um, all right, so I'm curious about this one too. Mariana, do you have plans to do another book? Perhaps one in Colombia? After you talked about that amazing trip, like I need to see I'm this. I'm going. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, probably. I mean, I feel like now that I've brought Colombia to Brooklyn and the US, um, we'll see, maybe there's a second book in the works. I'll stay tuned. <laughs> Well, I sure hope it does. And then I um, I always love to close with this question. It's just one of my own. Um, obviously, we're a bookstore, and we're always looking for more book recs. 
do either of you have any cookbook recommendations, any any book recommendations that um, have guided you on your own on your own journeys? Aran, do you wanna so many. take that one? I have so many. I, I'm very um, I'm very influenced by British food writers, just because and cookbook authors, just because that's kind of like what's close to me. Um, so of course, any Nigel Slater book, uh, Diana Henry, um, Gil Miller. I love. I mean, I'm probably going to be forgetting so many people, but um, I love those. I remember when I started. I was a. I went to culinary school and, and like Maria and I, I started in kind of professional kitchens and I remember I, this old like Michelle Bra, like all these kind of chefy books um, that I would buy. And then I, and I love them and they're still beautiful, but I, I realized at one point I kind of went into more, I wanted cookbooks to be a little bit more like movies. Like I keep saying that, but I, I want to have more story. And so um, like strong food writing is, or, and, together with photography is like really um, beautiful to me. So like this one. <laughs> How about you? Uh, for me, Molly Stevens is a great, great friend and incredible author. And she wrote a cookbook that I use all the time called All About Bracing. And talk about recipes that are written as literature. You know, they're, you can read the entire book cover to cover and learn so much and actually read through the process of each recipe and, and really kind of like understand her mind and learn about bracing in a great way. So that's one that I would really recommend. It's not a very summary book, but you know, for this fall, it's a good buy. So we, we actually got one more question and I think it's a great one. So I'm just gonna, I'm gonna throw it in here. Um, <laughs> what's a secret talent you don't know about? A secret what? Talent. <laughs> talent? Um, oh my God. So I guess the question would be if you, if you weren't, you know, a cookbook author or, you know, a chef, what, what would be your, your career? <laughs> um, Oh my God, what's a secret talent? I'm a really good driver. <laughs> like, you know, I learned how to drive in Bogota, which means like, you have to know how to drive. You have to be very brave and be very quick. <laughs> so. I think that's a good one. And that's certainly a useful, useful skill to have. <laughs> I am a terrible driver. <laughs> I, I'll drive with you. I hate driving. If I could have a driver, I w would. Yeah. I actually, I love, I don't look like I love makeup, but I love makeup. So I think I would want to be like a makeup artist. Oh, wow. Yeah, that makes sense. I think I it's like, this is like painting. Mm -hmm. I don't know. So silly, but. No. No, there's like an aesthetic quality there too. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Well, this was a great conversation. Do you guys have any closing remarks? Um, no? I just, again, congratulations, Mariana. And I'm so honored that you, that we're talking here. So I hope everybody goes in and uh, supports uh, Books and Books and uh, gets your book. Yeah. And have a Thanks, great time. Thank you so much for Books and Books to have us here. Um, you know, Miami, it's such a special place for me, for many Colombians and Books and Books is one of those places that is the heart of the city. And so thank you, thank you. Of course, happy to host you guys. And again, if you guys haven't ordered your book yet, you can do so by clicking the green button below or you can come visit us in our stores um, and see the beautiful book in person. So thank you again, everyone. Have a wonderful evening and hopefully we'll see you all at our next virtual event. Thank you. Okay. Bye guys. Bye.